Hi, in today's archaeonomy video I'll be delving into more detail on the topic of pa. In other videos where I mention them, I drew the comparison between hilltop pa and Neolithic hill forts from a non-New Zealand audience. That's a pretty rough generalisation, and this video will look into the matter in a much more detailed manner, and hopefully provide a good introduction to the topic. The first thing I need to address here is nomenclature. It's common in New Zealand to refer to any settlement where Māori lived as a pa. Archaeologists use the word a bit differently. When we refer to a pa, we're talking about a fortified position, while we would refer to an unfortified village as a papakainga or kainga. Now, the line between the two can be blurred horrendously. Most kainga had perimeter fences of some sort, and at what point do we consider a perimeter fence a fortified palisade? Do earthworks need to be involved? But not all pa needed earthworks. Pigeonholing and categorising things in archaeology is seldom a simple or straightforward task. Prehistoric pa fulfilled different purposes. Some were fortified settlements. Others were retreats located near unfortified settlements where the population could flee to if attacked. Some were defended storehouses, while others were isolated sentry posts or working within a defensive complex. Occasionally a pa would be a formal, ritualised battlefield. Many were also expressions of power. Grandiose places meant to intimidate and display wealth and success. Sometimes after a battle, a power would be declared tapu or sacred, and never used again, while other power would see battle after battle over the course of hundreds of years. Some would survive until the musket wars and then be overwhelmed. Others were so formidable that firearms technology would not be enough of a factor for them to fall. Others were modified during the musket wars to face the new threat, and also to make best use of muskets in their defence. In order to understand the context of their construction, you need to have some knowledge of pre-musket Maori warfare. When one looks at a hill fort or a castle, you can visualise defenders raining arrows down on attackers, and siege engines being used to batter down the defences. Neither of these were the case in New Zealand. Maori warfare was heavily focused on hand-to-hand -hand combat. They didn't really use bows or slings, though javelins were thrown. They had no access to siege engines of any kind until the introduction of cannon. So in terms of the arms race between offence and defence, the advantage definitely lay with defence in New Zealand, prior to the introduction of firearms. If a power was designed well, the only ways to take it would be siege or subterfuge. Due to the variety of power, I'll look at different elements of their fortifications, and then into how they can be combined in different ways. Natural topography can be a formidable defence in itself. Picking the right spot in the landscape for strategic and tactical advantage is fundamental to the creation of a fortification. Many power located on cliff tops or the top of steep hills. Obviously being in a commanding location means you can see far and wide but also anyone trying to climb these faces to access the power is extremely vulnerable to dropped objects from the power above, usually large stones. Māori cooked food using heated stones, so they were common in around their settlements. Other environmental factors such as access to fresh water were of paramount importance. I do not know of any examples of pre-European wells, but I do know of paths said to have hidden tunnels to allow defenders to access springs located outside the path. Terraces are an extremely common feature of par. These flat platforms were made to create more viable living space within the defences. Room for more houses and storage pits, and as a result create a steep slope above and below them. In a few cases these terraces were retained with dry stone walls. Otherwise wooden palisades could be used, or even no retention at all if the soil allowed. While not fortifications in themselves, the combination of palisading and the steep scarp of terraces could be used to funnel attackers into killing zones. Wooden palisading was a key part of par design. Sometimes a double row of palisades would be employed, and the defenders, armed with long wooden spears, you can almost call them pikes, could thrust between the timbers at anyone within reach outside. Given the exposed location of many par, they could also serve as windbreaks, making life a bit more pleasant for the occupants of said par. As the most visible feature of a par, the palisades would often contain large carved posts, often showing features of ancestors as part of the display aspect of the place. Fighting platforms were tall wooden towers that often straddled the palisades, 
where large stones would be stockpiled. Given the relative lack of missile weapons in traditional Maori warfare, the warriors in these fighting platforms could hurl these stones down on attackers with complete impunity. In the early phases of the musket wars, the warriors who were exposed on these platforms would be extremely vulnerable to musket fire, and often were oblivious to the new threat posed by these weapons. Ditches and banks are an extremely common and very important defensive earthwork normally used to reinforce a section of the past defences where the natural defences are inadequate. Typically, the ditch will be dug out and the spoil piled on the inside of it to build a bank. The later banks of gunfighter power would be made solid through layering packed earth with bracken fern, and we've got no reason to believe that the earlier banks were constructed any differently. The bank could then be reinforced with a palisade and fighting platforms constructed on top of it. Depending on the topography, these ditch and bank features can be used in different ways, cutting off key routes of access or completely encircling a location. Pa, like any fortification, contained features unrelated to the fortifications themselves, structures that the fortification served to protect. Storage pits and raised partica, houses and cooking areas. These same features can be found in unfortified settlements, and in some cases, these structures were dismantled for material during sieges, and the timber was used to add or to modify the defences. Now I'll look through some examples of PAR, and you can see how these different defensive features were employed in practice. My first and most detailed example is Turmawana PAR in Hawke's Bay. I've chosen this one as it has an array of different defences, and it's been archaeologically investigated by the English archaeologist Lady Eileen Fox in 1974-75. to Lady Fox identified three phases of occupation, an initial undefended settlement at the end of the point that gradually grew. In phase two, C14 dated to around 1620 AD, a palisade was constructed protecting the eastern side and a section along the western side, both of which could be approached via a gentler slope, and were thus more vulnerable. The entrance to the east had a path of broken hungy stones leading up to it, probably to provide traction on the sloping ground. I don't really trust the C14 dates from this site. Many C14 dates in New Zealand archaeology have been discarded for various reasons. Some of the dates from this site predate the Maori occupation in New Zealand altogether, and these extremely old samples were taken from the heartwood of posts, which will have inbuilt age. Steep cliffs protect the site from the north, more than enough to defend the site from that direction. Uh, the rough Google surface model here makes them look a lot less imposing than they really are. If there were palisades at the top of these cliffs, which would be useful as a windbreak if nothing else, there remains no evidence of them. They are either never there, or the post holes have eroded away down the slope. You can see from Lady Fox's map that half of the Kumara pit has eroded over the edge, so there has been significant erosion of that area. Phase 3 involved the creation of ditches and banks on the southern front, with fighting platforms flanking the entrance. A second ditch was dug 45 metres in front of the first, designed to funnel any attackers into a concentrated area. A large Whanganui was constructed in this space, with one side protected by a palisade. Apparently, there was no room for such a large structure within the already built-up older section of the PA. Hopefully, you can see the many storage pits within the PA. It's quite overgrown now. Many small terraces were cut into the more gradual slopes to support more pits and houses, and another ditch and bank was constructed further to the south to create a defended, wide-open space to the south of the PA. Lady Fox didn't excavate the entire site. I've highlighted her excavated areas in red here. So we don't have a complete picture of the PA, but the picture is a lot better than we normally have, as we actually have some idea of the timber elements of the defences. Many PA are not that sophisticated. Simply cutting off a ridgeline or headland using a section of ditch and bank, and using the naturally steep slopes for defence, is an extremely common way to make a basic PA. Just around the coast at Ocean Beach, you can see Matarau PA which has a large ditch and bank on the north side, enclosing a flat platform containing several large raised room storage pits. Another example of this type of power lies completely unseen in the heart of New Zealand's largest city. Oniwa Power is located directly under the northern end of the Auckland Harbour Bridge, protected by a sizable ditch and sheer natural cliffs dropping into the sea. 
At one point in its history, it dominated this part of the north shore of the Waitemata Harbour. Now over 15,000 people drive over it every day, completely oblivious to its existence. While we're in Auckland, the many enormous hilltop cone par were fortified using a combination of natural slopes, steep and scarps created by their numerous terraces, and lots of palisading. These large complexes utilise ditches and banks in strategic places. They're simply too large to completely encircle and be defendable. Because of their sheer size, they are unlikely to function properly as a single defensive feature at all, instead working as a network of defended locations where one or more parts could be occupied at any one time. The archaeological company Geometria has done a 3D digital reconstruction of a section of Monga Keke Pa for the interpretation centre there. Here at Ota Utu Pa in Taranaki, you can see a combination of multiple straight ditches and banks cutting off red lines and larger curved ditch encircling the hilltop. This was a fearsome power that dominated the rich agricultural land around and the river that it overlooks. When ditches completely encircle hilltops, usually because the surrounding natural slope is not steep enough to be relied upon as a defence in itself, we call them ring ditch power. This is an extremely common form of pa in the Taranaki landscape. This example is Pikituroa pa, which has a complete ring ditch encircling a low hill, enclosing a number of kumara pits. Now there are other categories of prehistoric pa that I've not mentioned yet. Swamp pa and lake pa. These use water features rather than steep slopes and earthworks for protection. The pa itself is built on either an artificial or a natural island and anyone wanting to approach would need to traverse a dangerous swamp or cross a lake, serving as a giant natural moat. When attackers reach the par, they'll be faced with a solid wooden palisade topped with fighting platforms full of warriors dropping stones on their heads. Not a pleasant prospect. Due to the widespread draining of wetlands in New Zealand for farming, most of these par are now completely invisible in the landscape. Though the waterlogged nature of the soils had the potential to anaerobically preserve artefacts that would have rotted to dust in hilltop sites. This is Roto Atara, one of the most important par sites of Hawke's Bay. It was a lake par. The lake has now clearly been drained. This little hillock was the par itself, surrounded by water, with secondary hilltop par located around the lake as gatekeepers and sentry posts. This is Kaipoi par. I mentioned it in one of my tour videos before. It was a Naitahu stronghold constructed around 1700 AD, which used a combination of ditch and bank defences and natural estuarine swamps on three sides, which made it near impregnable until the musket wars. Kohika Pa is probably the most famous swamp pa in New Zealand. That's famous amongst archaeologists. Most Kiwis will never have heard of it. It's been the subject of multiple archaeological investigations, and has revealed a great array of wood and fibre artefacts. This is a kete, a traditional Maori bag made from woven flax leaves. And this is a hinaki, an eel trap made from manuka stems woven with kekia fibre. I hope this video has given a good general introduction to prehistoric Maori pa sites. There are around 7,250 recorded prehistoric pa in New Zealand. 7,120 of those are in the North Island. This shows the massive need for the protection of fortifications in the 300 years of on and off intertribal warfare that occurred before the arrival of Europeans in New Zealand. Pa are an important archaeological site type in New Zealand. I'm sure I'll return to the topic many times to discuss different aspects in detail. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment and subscribe. Cheers.